good afternoon for everybody. Today's speaker is Tami Elliot. Uh, she's uh, Canadian and uh, she is a member of our research group of plant based systematics at our department. Uh, she has sold all three degrees of uh, uh, university studies in Canada. Uh, the, Bachelor degree she completed uh, at the University of Saskatchewan with um, the thesis focused on uh, Litvin salicaria, that is a species uh, invasive in uh, North American wetlands. Um, subsequently, she studied uh, at uh, the University of British Columbia in Vancouver and. Uh, Completed here uh, her uh, master thesis focused on the comparison between the grazed and non grazed uh, meadows of uh, Canadian high Arctic. And finally, uh, at uh, the University of McGill in Montreal, uh, she uh, observed a PhD study with uh, the thesis uh, focused on the application of uh, local phylogenies uh, on the study of uh, plant community diversity. During uh, her internship in uh, Cape Town University, uh, she was focused on the taxonomy of cyberacy particularly of the tribe Chene in Czech pronunciation Schene, uh, comprising uh, the genus uh, Schenus, uh, Chinus, and uh, its uh, relatives uh, under uh, supervision of uh, uh, Professor Mutama Muazia and uh, the results of this study will be uh, the main part So, please take the floor. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction, Peter. So today I'm going to be talking to you a lot about sedges. So you're going to hear a common theme throughout the presentation, but some of it will be based on my background in research in other areas of Cyperaceae, and that will go into what I'm doing now, which is also focused on Cyperaceae. So if I'm going to talk about sedges, I'm going to start with a little bit of introduction of sedges. So here, this is in the Canadian subarctic, and this is what we call a fen, a miniotropic peatland, miniotropic peatland, which is dominated by Cyperaceae. So within small areas of that fen, you can have as many as 15 species within maybe a couple square meters. Here is another ecosystem. This one is our vegetation type. This one is in southern Africa, which, and this one also has a lot of sedges. But a lot of people come to this beautiful Finbus ecosystem and they totally miss the sedges because they're looking for those other beautiful flowers that you see in the Cape, such as the bulbs and everything like that, the ericas, and you end up missing these guys. They're clumps of grass. They're not charismatic, and because of that, they hadn't received a lot of taxonomic attention. So before we really get into talking about the details, here's a little bit of phylogenetic background on the Cyperaceae. So this is from the Androsperum phylogeny group, and it shows you more or less where the poales is. So the poales are in the monocots. And when we zoom in even more, this is looking at order poales. You have several different families. One of those main families is the poaceae, the grasses, the restionaceae, which is they're really common in southern Africa and Australia, but highlighted in red are the cyperaceae. So this is what I focus on. Now currently, we've just had a big publication out in the last couple months, the Cyperaceae Working Group, where we present a new phylogeny. So we break the Cyperaceae up into several different tribes, and the tribe that I'm going to talk to you today is Tribe Shine. So you're going to be hearing a lot of Shine. And within Tribe Shine, there's been a 
further classification into eight separate subtribes. So this one in red here is the Xiene. So that's where I really focus on. And what do I look at? What do my sedges look like? Just a little bit of a background. They're just a clump. There's no leaves on the stem. There's leaves at the base of some of them, but not all of them. And at the top, it looks like it's terminal, but it's not, well, it is terminal. It's a terminal inflorescence or flowering crust cluster. So this is what I look at when I'm doing my, when I've done my taxonomy. Now those flowering clusters at the top are composed of several different, or a whole bunch of different spikelets. So in the case of the, shin, the sheenus, you have basal glooms, and then you have more glooms going up, and inside you have several different spikelets. And if you go down even further and get in more, your basic idea, this is a basic cyperaceae diagram. You have the ovary, stigmas, the, uh, the style, two stigmas, three anthers. So there's a three if you're in the monocots rule. So this is sort of an, ide uh, an example of an idealized cyperaceae, but this is what you might see underneath those glooms in the cyperaceae spikelet. Here, it's the fruit. We call it, or I call it, when I'm doing my taxonomy, a nutlet. And you have here, you have the glooms coming out, and then you have the akeen, which just becomes the hard fruit. I like the akeens, what I call a nutlet. Now, where are the cyperaceae? Apart from Antarctica, they're all over the place. And especially common is the genus Carex in the temperate climates. Um, when we published this publication just a couple months ago, we've given the figure of 5,600, and it's growing. So there's a lot of taxonomy. It's a very active working group, the Cyperaceae. So there's a lot being done at the moment. And uses, it's just several different uses, you know, in some places they might be used for basket weaving, and actual some places, Cyprus, the bulbs, are used as a food source in areas of Africa. But for what I'm talking about a little bit today, forage. So where I'm from in Saskatchewan, we'd have wetlands, they're called sloughs, and around them there would be a circle of sedges. It wasn't ideal food for the cattle. They had to run out of grasses, they could eat the sedges. So this sort of brings me to my master studies, which was on Cyperaceae. And in my master studies that I did in the Canadian High Arctic, there is one major grazer who focuses on sedge communities, Cyperaceae communities. And he is a muskox. So the muskoxen, I don't know if you've heard about them before, they're actually related to the sheep, and they have special adaptations that allow them to digest the special, the high silicate um, sedges that not every mammal has. So this is one of my study sites from my masters. And my masters was here just to give you a little bit of geographical orientation. So if you have North Canada, and there in the white, the top right-hand corner is Greenland, so you see there, Greenland. My study site was Alexander Fjord, which was adjacent to, Norm to Greenland. And I did my master's research with a fellow named Greg Henry at the University of British Columbia. And I did it on grazed and ungrazed wet sedge meadows in the Canadian High Arctic. And we were really fortunate enough during that time to use a wonderfully beautiful research site called Alexander Fjord. Alexander Fjord was originally established by the RCMP in the 1950s for the purpose of Canadian sovereignty. Because in the High Arctic, there's not a lot of people that live there, they needed to have a presence of people, the Canadian government. So they put an RCMP post, a police post, Canadian police post, up in this very remote location. After 10 years of being active as an RCMP post, it became, it was unactive, and it was later taken up as a research 
station. And the person who took it up and who established it as an ecology research station was an alumni of Masaryk, Joseph Svoboda. So Joseph, what I understood, sort of got Alexandra Fjord going as a research site. And his story was that he was here at Masaryk in 1948. And eventually he was arrested and was ma and managed to go to Canada 20 years later, during the, after the uprising or during the uprising, I'm not quite sure. He went to university for one year at the University of Western Ontario as an undergraduate. And then he went immediately to the University of Alberta to do a PhD. And within a few years, he got a PhD and became a renowned professor in ecology, in northern ecology, at the University of Toronto. So my connection with Joseph is through Greg, my master's supervisor. So after my master's, I went on to study more sedges, and this is in the Canadian subarctic. And as I mentioned previously, this is a fen, which is a peatland that is rich in nutrients. And it is dominated by plants of the family Cyperaceae. So if you're working in the Canadian high Arctic, in the subarctic, there is a lot of bugs. I guess people tell me it might be a little bit like Scandinavia for you guys. So you have to be fully covered or you will come out full of blood from the <laughs> black flies, the diptera. And so here's a where I was. So the subarctic is sort of medium latitudes across Canada. And it's quite an inhospitable land. It's not very, there's not a lot of people in that region either. And it's full of peatlands. It's wet and it's buggy. Because of the peatlands, there's also not a lot of roads because you can't put good road infrastructure on peatlands. My study was based on, up in this site, was based on plots. 0.2 meters squared and 1.0 meters squared circular plots. And in those, I was looking at the co-occurrence of different Cyperaceae species. And specifically, one of my chapters, just a quick outline, a quick description. So I was looking at the phylogenetic relationships of the co-occurring plants. And here's a, a brief summary of a result. I found that when I pooled all the results from my one meter squared plot data, I found that plants of one clade of carex tended to be more related, so tend to co-occur with other species that were more related than expected by chance, whereas species from group three, that's in the red, tended to co-occur with less related species than expected by chance. So the concept here is we're, we're mixing ecology with phylogeny to help us understand ecological concepts better. So that was my PhD, or a brief, how I had some P Cyperaceae in my PhD. So then I went on to the beautiful southern tip of South Africa. So this is the Finbus vegetation type. Finbus, fine-leafed, it's sclerophyllous. And within this mountainous habitat, there's often several different species of shinae, or shinus sedges. Again, here is what I showed you earlier. So they tend to be clump forming, no leaves along the stems, and a flowering head at the top. So when I got to Cape Town, these Sheenus species, really no one knew much about them. They were unlabeled folders in a herbarium. And I put it together, or we started with this. So this is what the phylogeny was looking like. It's not monophyletic. So you had a group of plants with totally different names, Epichenus, Tetraria, and Sheenus all together. So you, I had to start by doing a taxonomic realignment. So all those 24 Epichenus and Petraria species that were in that group, I had to change their names to make them all Sheenus species. 
So new combos, new combinations, we call that. So by doing that, I changed, I started with a taxonomic realignment and then I stepped into the next stage of the research, which I'm looking at all of these. So these are three of the separate species. In total in the region, at the final part of my research, we had 44 different species of Sheenus, but here's three examples of what they look like in the field. Two of those species I described myself. So I had mentioned previously that not a lot of work had been done on the Southern African Sheenus before I got there, but a couple people had touched upon it a little bit. Charles Baron Clark, at between the late 1800s and the early 1900s, had done some work, but at that time it was Epichenus and Tetraria, he was calling them. Another person, Margaret Levins, more in the mid-1950s had been doing some taxonomy in the group, again, when they were called Tetraria and Epichenus, and she described a few species herself. So here's a look. So she has a, a Tetraria publication that I referred to a lot, and an Epichenus where she described several species of Epichenus that I used as bases for my taxonomic work. So my work resulted in four different taxonomic revisions in the South African Journal of Botany. So these are very detailed taxonomic works, recircumscribing, doing name changes, creating type specimens. For a taxonomy, taxonomical minded person, that's fantastic work to do, but it's a lot of archival work. And just a story to sort of tie together, this was in the last month of my research. This is one of the botanists who I collaborated with. So Doug Houston Brown would be, he's a professional botanist. He has his own consulting company and he found something. He comes to me at the end of November, 2019, and he found something that looked odd to us. But Muthama Muyasya and myself had already sort of um, noted that there were some odd specimens in our folders that we couldn't identify with any of the other 43 species that we had described. And so I had sort of flagged these specimens. And coincidentally, at that time, a couple weeks later, that, uh, that me flagging them, Doug comes in with an interesting specimen that happened to fit into that circumscription, of, or that to fit with what I had found at another site in southern Africa. It had longer spikelets than anything else we had seen, which set it apart. And it was, they were quite long and shiny. And in the past, there was more of this habitat, but a lot of the habitat where this plant had belonged to was converted to urban areas in Cape Town itself. But one of those urban areas isn't, wasn't converted in its actual a natural area, and that's where Doug found it. It was called Takai Park, he found it. And because of that, it actually raises, when you found these rare species, new rare species, it raises the value of the conservation value of the park. So he was happy to find it. I was happy to find that we found it because it matched what other things we had been seeing in the herbarium. So we described it and we had it published in Phytotaxa. So some other parts of the Sheenus project, I created websites for all of the species that are Currently, their names are currently accepted through the international names databases. And I have an iNaturalist project for the Southern African Sheenus, which there is a number of contributors. I think it's, you know, in the name 15, 20 different contributors that I, that I correspond with when they post things. But it has sort of raised the awareness of something that really had no name four years ago. So what are Sheenists looking like? So I wrote a paper last year, or those published recently, with a group of Australian and Southern African colleagues. And we have several different growth types, which are on the top. You have little plants that are barely this high. To plants that grow over a meter tall, all, plump, all clumps of grassy leaves. And on the second, on the bottom part, you have what their spikelets look like. So you have variations. Some are hanging, some are clustered, some are long, some are short. Most people really wouldn't see a difference, but for the trained eye, there is a lot of difference. 
Where do you find Sheenus worldwide? This is a figure that we had published. The highest diversity worldwide is in Western Australia and Southern Africa. However, you do find them in the Pacific region, Southeast Asia, and a little bit in the north. In the continent, in, um, here in Europe, you find Sheenus nigricans and Ferrigineus also. Just to highlight where you find them in Southern Africa, and Australia, it tends to, in Australia, along the coast, especially in Western Australia, the Kwanga, they call it Kwanga vegetation type. And in Southern Africa, it's mostly in the Western Cape province, in the Finbus, but you also find some in grasslands of the Drakensberg, which is a very beautiful area. So when we did our paper, we looked at, we made a big phylogeny, of course, that's what we do. And we found the phylogeny based on the markers we worked with showed two major clades of Sheenus. And within one of those clades, you have the Southern African Sheenus. Now those are the ones, the 44 species that I focus on. So a little bit of biogeography here. Here's a, a world map. We have different colors. This is for Sheenus, this is in the context of Sheenus. We don't have a lot of Sheenus in the whole Arctic region. So the whole Arctic is one color, it's purple. But of no, we look at the green, which is Australia. Western Australia is light green. The rest of Australia is dark green. And Africa you see in blue. So these are key areas for the biogeography. And we put those areas onto a phylogeny. So this is called an ancestral area reconstruction. And we see that the southern African species that I work on are at the top of the phylogeny. So they're one monophyletic group. So we find that there's a, a group with widespread taxa, taxa that you even find in South, Southern America, South America, and New Zealand, and you, then you have the Southern African clade. This bottom clade is mostly Australia, Pacific, and Southeast Asia. So that is the background in Sheenus. I'll be coming to it again. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about holocentric chromosomes, genome size, and polyploidy because this relates to what I'm doing now. So, you have two, if you divide them into two major types of chromosomes, you have the monocentric with your localized centromeres, and you have holocentric, holocentric chromosomes with centromeres along the length of the chromosome, or a diffuse centromere. So why is that, and one reason why it's important is that the spindle microtubules can attach to the entire length of the holocentric chromosome. So here we have an example of a breakage in a monocentric and a holocentric chromosome. If you see, I've cut one. So what happens? Two separate scenarios can happen. In a holocentric, that broken fragment can actually remain a viable chromosome. But in a monocentric species, this often, the chromosome is inviable doesn't exist, any, that part of the genetic material is gone. Across the angiosperm tree of life, we find several interesting examples of holocentric chromosomes. In the Cuscuta, subgenera Cuscuta, Myristica, which is the nutmegs, Drosera, you can, everybody should know those, are the coniferous little sundew plants, and in the cyprids. So Cyperaceae family, and also, when I mean the Cyperids, it's the Cyperaceae and its sister family, the Juncaceae. So most of the Juncaceae, I think, are showing holocentrism. So they're looking into exactly who now in the Juncaceae shows that. And a key concept to understand is that genome size and chromosome number aren't the same thing. So you can have a lot of chromosomes, like this carex here, 
the little grass-like plant that I drew, he has a lot of chromosomes. But his genome size is actually very small because there's not a lot of genetic material, genomic material in those chromosomes. On the left hand side, my left hand side, is an example of the largest genome size. So he has a lot of chromosomes, but there's also a lot of genomic material in those very large chromosomes. Intermediate, I give one who has a moderate amount, but with large chromosomes. So you have this whole continuous span of genome sizes. Just to give you some processes that might happen between differences in chromosome numbers and difference in genome sizes. So if we look on the y-axis, we have differences in chromosome numbers. And you might get more chromosome numbers in holocentrics. Here we're talking about holocentrics. If you have a chromosome break, so that's called fission. But if you have a chromosome come together, that's fusion, so you'd actually have less. So you can see that along your y-axis. Now along the x-axis, we're looking at genome size in this case. So you can have more DNA by DNA, repetitive DNA proliferation or less by DNA removal. Now looking at a comparison between monocentrics and holocentrics in this example, and looking at within the chromosome sizes within different genera, Peter and Franta, they compared monocentrics to holocentrics and found the variation within genera of holocentrics in chromosome sizes was a lot larger. So you're getting a lot larger differences in chromosome sizes according to this data set in the holocentrics. Now we're going to come back here and we're going to talk more about the Cyperaceae and we're going into the Shinae again. So try Shinae and the Shinae, which is where the Shinas sit. Now what happens in the genome sizes in tribe Shinae? So I've, I have the eight different sub-tribes up in the top corner. And the Shinae is which of the Shinas are. If you look at the, the genome sizes across the Shinae, they're very, very small generally. They're constrained. That's sort of a sign that you're having these tiny little chromosomes that break, that fragment, and they fuse, and they, they have fission. But when we look at the Shinus, which here is the Shinae, it's the same thing, the, the, only, the only genus in the Shinae is Shinus. <laughs> That's how taxonomy works. Um, you have a wide variation. So what I, what I was seeing, there's some cases where you have very small chromosomes, and a fair amount of them. And I think this is mostly in the Australian taxa. But what I was seeing in the Southern African taxa were big fat chromosomes. So those genome sizes were actually quite large. So there's been within that Sheenus phylogeny that I showed you, there's been something happened that has made the chromosomes from small to large. Now if we look at chromosome numbers, here again, we have the eight subtribes of tribe Shinae. There's not the same pattern. Numbers don't really tell you anything. There, I, I gotta tell you to start with too, there's not, in some of these other subtribes, there's not a lot of samples to work with. So they're understudied by far. There's only a few counts in some of them. So with time, we're gonna get more information on this. But we don't find an interesting real specific pattern in the Sheenus, which are subtribe Shinae. Now, if we put this on a phylogeny, though, like I was leading into about a minute ago, we see this. If you look at the light colors, they symbolize small genome sizes across the Shinus. And once you get to that southern African clade of Shinus, you have an explosion of genome sizes, which would be, it's interesting to see. It's interesting to think of what might be happening with that. It could be more polyploidy, for example could be more repetitive sequence accumulation. We'll get back to that in a minute. Chromosome numbers, on the other hand, don't really show that pattern. Just like across the other graphs I showed you, we're not seeing a pattern in chromosome numbers. They're all over the place. 
So in the southern African genus, if we put chromosome number beside genome size, so here genome size is in blue and chromosome number is in red, there's no pattern that pops out. You can see with the chromosome number there are a few species that have much higher chromosome number values, but mostly it's quite general, not any part of the phylogeny showing a specific pattern. If you take the data for genome size and chromosome number and you plot it and do a phylogenetically corrected regression, so PGLS, you find I do get a significant relationship between the two variables in the genus. So it is positively correlated. Now, yeah, that's not that interesting, you might think, but the Cyperaceae, because of their holocentric chromosomes, are a little unique compared to some other groups. So it has been, this positive relationship has been documented in one other genera, it's Eliacris. You have Eliacris here, we have Eliacris in Canada also. They're, they like the mud. And you can see a positive relationship also. But this positive relationship, we're not sure how general it is across the Cyperaceae. In the past, about over 10 years ago, Eric Rulison wrote an article on what is happening with chromosome numbers and genome size evolution in the Cyperaceae. And one of his big conclusions of his paper is that within the Cyperaceae, aneuploidy dominates. But there is some evidence of polyploidy. Now, Eric, at the same time, Andrew Hip was doing a lot of work on the Carex. So Carex has over 2,000 species worldwide. And a lot of these species are in Europe, Western Europe, and North America. So they have really received a lot of academic, taxonomic, ecological attention over the years. So Andrew Hip wrote, and based on his research, he wasn't finding a lot of polyploidy, but he was documenting a lot of fission and fusion. So chromosome breakage because of the holocentricism and chromosome fusion. So what am I finding in the Southern African genus? So when I did my taxonomy, based on phylogenetic relationships, we're working with three different subgroups, or three different groups, I call them. We have on top the blue, this is the Sheenus cuspidatus group, and the Sheenus compar Sheenus pictus group in the middle in green, and at the bottom we have the epi Sheenus group. So what do we find? Do we find any polyploidy? Now I used a program Chrome called Chrome Evol to infer ploidy levels. It's interesting. I think it works well for some groups. It did give me it gave me results that said there are seven different polyploids based on the data I inputted. Um, polyploid species, and they're scattered throughout those three main groups. So they're not clustered within any one group. And with data on genome sizes, we went in and we sort of looked at, out of those seven species, it looks like there's intraspecific ploidy differences also happening. So you might have a diploid and a polyploid with the same species name, which what you might call autopolyploidy. So again, they're spattered throughout the phylogeny, but most of those are in the really complex Sheenus cuspidatus group, which are taxonomically confusing. You know, one day might receive more taxonomic attention. So polyploidy itself, I'm going through the literature right now, in the Cyperaceae, it tends to be, it's not like the Poaceae, where there's massive amounts of polyploidy, but there's isolated ca cases of polyploidy that have been documented in the Cyperaceae. And you really have to look at the evidence to see if it is robust. Sometimes people claim polyploidy, but really they don't have the evidence. Just because something's intermediate between two different species doesn't mean that its genome size is double. So you have to look, but 
It has also been reported in the Rhinoxpera group, the Eleacris genus, and also in the Sheenus by a group of New Zealand researchers. So there has been some cases, but it tends to be isolated cases. So we're trying to get an idea how prevalent it might be, you know, in one different, one well-studied group. So if you were to look, we're coming back to this diagram that I showed earlier in the presentation today with chromosome number and genome sizes and the different processes at play. The genome size, or the genome repetitive sequence removal, addition, so changing the size of the genome size, and then up and down along the y-axis, you have fission and fusion. But on top of that, if you go down along, I guess you call that the diagonal, you have polyploidy. So if you get into that top corner, and you're a, you're a point up there, that's suggesting you might be a polyploid along sort of a regression line like this. So what do I find? This is the data for the species that are specimen, species, based specimens, that I had genome sizes and chromosome counts for. And I found what was, you know, I showed it previously, but I didn't have it in polyploid diploid. It was a positive correlation. But if we look specifically at the points, yes, in that top right-hand corner, we do see more polyploids. But there's a couple of other outliers that we need to think about. One is it along here, it had a, a base chromosome number of 25, <clears throat> and, but it had a very small genome size. So I actually knew the genome size before I did the count. And I was expecting a high chromosome number, but I didn't get it. I got small little chromosomes on several counts. So that is indicative of a fragmentation. Almost an entire genome that's, you know, small, medium, such as breaks. Now, you wouldn't get that in the monocentrics, but you do get it in the holocentrics. And there's another one a species that I found the genome size and the and the chromosome number is quite complex or confusing, and it had a small, uh, few chromosomes, but a fairly large genome size. To me, it looked like it should have been a different case. It, to me, it looked like it should have had more chromosomes, but it didn't when I did the counts. So that might be a case of fusion. So I guess to conclude, like the case in the Cyperaceae is not easy, and you just can't rely on data from chromosome counts have to consider other sources of information like genome size, um, detailed maybe genomic type studies that people are doing now will give you the information, um, different staining methods of the chromosomes showing the hybridization might also help. But you did, Chromaval itself might be suitable for monocentrics, that program that I used, but not holocentrics, some other type of inference must be included. So when something's reported polyploid in this type of, in different types of studies, we have to really think about what it is that they're reporting. Now I'm going to switch again, and I'm going to talk a little more about polyploidy and genome sizes as responses to differences in environmental factors. So environmental factors, I'm talking about edaphic, like soil nutrients, and I'm talking about climatic, temperature and precipitation. Now if you look at DNA, DNA needs a lot of nutrients just to create itself, or molecules. It needs a lot of phosphorus in the DNA backbone, that phosphate backbone. You see it requires a lot of phosphorus. And if you look at those nucleotide bases, here's an example of cytosine it has a lot of nitrogen. So the, the organism must get that phosphorus and nitrogen from somewhere. So does it follow that a species that has a larger genome would also need more nitrogen and phosphorus? And in the case of a plant, where does it get this? It gets it from the soil. So this is work that Peter published, Peter Schmarta published, earlier, you know, about six, seven years ago, 
but they were looking on plot grassland type experiments. And they, they showed some relationships. And here, there's some other things other than soil that we can consider when we look at genome size or polyploid um, response to the environment. There's also climatic. So you have elevation and latitude out, out as you go north to higher elevations or up in latitude, you can get lower temperatures or large temperature ranges, swings in temperatures day to night. Also precipitation differences. You know, this dry climates and seasonality. Why are all these, how are all these things connected? Is all of these temperature, precipitation, the dry precipitation, big temperature ranges, precipitation, seasonality, have been hypothesized to lead to a greater proportion of unreduced gametes happening during, that are formed during cell division. Well, if you have a cell where the, um, more gametes, unreduced gametes, you could have more polyploidy. So how did I look at this? So I got data from specimens that I had collected in the field. I augmented that with data from my taxonomic revisions where I reviewed over 2,000 specimens and got latitude and longitude associated with the ones I could. And I also got data from my naturalist contributors that I mentioned previously in, in places where I could actually verify the, the, the pictures they had sent me. And I extracted data from some major databases. One is CHELSA. So the climatology at high resolution for the Earth's land surface area. So it's a um, database that people can get now bioclim variables from. It used to be just worldclim, but now you can get bioclim from this and worldclim. And I used specimen level data. So it's not pooled per species. It's based on each specimen because one, spe one species can have diploid, one species can, that same species can also have polyploid. I have a separate data set too of plot level, so right where the soil, the root soil was. So I extracted the plants that I got the genome sizes from, and some of them I was able to keep the, the soils for, and I did nitrogen and phosphorus measurements. So I ended up having a data set that looked like this. We have response variables. We have two separate response, so two separate sets of analyses here with ploidy as one, ploidy level, so that would be diploid or polyploid, would be your response, or genome size in the other sets. So that's a continuous. And looking at the extracted, I had an extracted data set where I took these data from um, CHELSA and soils grid and things like that. Just took, I had a lat long point and I was able to get the values that way. But I had a second complementary set of data for just a, a small amount of species where I actually measured from the roots. So that's the measured data set. And I used an analysis called the MCMC GLM analysis. It's, it is, like its name, it is somewhat complex to interpret and to implement, partially because it's Bayesian. Because I do a lot of phylogenetics, I do have a lot of experience working with some Bayesian models. So it's based on something called a Markov chain Monte Carlo sampler. So that's the MCMC. And the GLMM stands for general linear, general linear mixed models. So you have a whole different family of models that you can draw from. It's Bayesian. And I choose this because I had specimen-based data where one specimen could either be a polyploid or one species could be both polyploid or diploid. So there's intraspecific ploidy differences. And also this framework of using the MCMC GLMM allowed me to incorporate the phylogenetic relationships among variables as a random effect. Now when I did the ploidy analysis, it's actually 
equivalent to a logistic regression, but a, or somewhat equivalent to a regression in how you interpret it. And it was using ploidy as the categorical response. So right off the bat, the NNP from my measured data sets for both genome size and ploidy show nothing, which isn't really that surprising because by the time I, you know, had to filter all the samples and took out what I couldn't use. There wasn't a lot of N value, a lot of power left. But when I look at the extracted values, I did find some relations. So elevation, when I looked at ploidy as the response to all these different environmental factors, I didn't find anything in elevation nitrogen or phosphorus, but I did find a relationship in some of the temperature and precipitation variables. But as much as I found there, and some of them I found a lot, it depends on how the really is sensitive the model to how your, your species are classified as polyploid and Deployed, and the truth is, with the Chrome Evel results, working with a, my very dynamic and different like chromosome numbers, which are all over the place, I didn't get that much consistent results with Chrome Chrome Evel, and because of that, I'm not really confident with my with what the classification of polyploid and diploid was, and therefore not very confident with the results. But that problem doesn't really exist when you look at genome size. I actually get more samples because I didn't have to take out of the data set the ambiguous samples that I didn't know were diploid or polyploid. I could use everything I just had a genome size for and a latitude and longitude. And because of that, I did get one relationship and it was with nitrogen and it was a positive relationship. So species in my Southern African Sheenus data set with larger genomes, we're associated with sites with larger, with more nitrogen. So to summarize the presentation, this part of the presentation, there is an evidence of polyploidy in Sheenus, but I need more than chromosome counts. Uh, positive relationship between genome size and chromosome number, I showed you that on the regression. And a positive, positive, possible positive relationship between nitrogen and genome size. So this is going into the final part of the presentation. Now I'm going to talk scale up to the cyprids. So I mentioned to you earlier that the cyprids are basically this are, are the Cyperaceae and its sister family, the Juncaceae. And most of these, the Cyperaceae, we're assuming are all holocentric. And a good portion of the junk ACA are also holocentric. Now, why does this make a good study system? It's because we don't have to correct for growth form. They're all basic graminoids that aren't that tall. So grass-like plants. So I talked to you before about some hypotheses related to temperature, precipitation, nitrogen, and phosphorus. But there's also another one that this data set was, that I'm going to be talking about, was more, was, was suitable to study, and it is the relationship between population sizes and smaller genomes. And the hypothesis is that more selection will lead to species, more natural selection will lead to species having smaller genomes. And you get more natural selection or more selection pressure on them when the population sizes are larger. And what happens, why you're getting smaller genomes is because this pressure is removing the deleterious extra genetic material that really, and extra genetic material that is genomic material that isn't really helpful. So there's sort of a, a hypothesis out there that says a larger population size you'd expect a smaller genome. So here we're looking at population sizes, but instead of population size, I'm going to look at worldwide range size as the proxy. And I'm going to do that, and I'm also going to do something called a niche, a niche size that I calculate. 
Can we go back to the other hypotheses we're looking at? So we talked earlier about the nitrogen and phosphorus expectations that someone might have. And also the climatic expectations. And this is related, like I said, to unreduced gametes. So here we have the data set. So this is a worldwide global data set on the cyprids. And I extracted latitude and longitude information from GBIF and used that latitude and longitude to extract climatic variables from the Chelsea database that I mentioned before and from soils grid. So soils grid, I was able to get nitrogen. I was able to get a whole bunch of different ones different soil characteristics. So you get the data from GBIF, then you have to extract the different nitrogen, temperature or precipitation points for each, each point from GBIF you have. Then you have to remove collinear variables and then model. That was my steps. So first I looked at, I got all my GBIF data and I removed points violating specific criteria, and in this case, we did a, a, cleaning, a cleaning process. And the thing is with GBIF data, you can get a fair amount of garbage from your data. The, I'm not gonna say, I think it's really improved in the last five, 10 years. There's been a, there's been a, what I've heard, a concerted effort to clean up the database. And I know the Cyperacea people were planning on doing even something a step above in the next five years, potentially. Um, so I used, I downloaded the GBIF data and then I did a, a series of cleaning criteria, some using an R package called Coordinate Cleaner. But I also used maps or geographical area information from the World Checklist of Selected Plant Families to help clean my data. And I chose this database because for the Cyperaceae, it's well curated. It's got fairly up-to-date information on worldwide Cyperaceae, where it's found across different countries, where they're found across different countries. So for each species, I was able to create a map based on the WCSB, where you'd expect to find them. And if a GBIF point fell outside of that, we eliminated that point. We also limited points for species that were introduced to an area, so that would be called their secondary range. Here is some of the, in this case, this is mean annual precipitation, soil nitrogen, some of the other variables that I were able to extract once I got my latitude and longitude cleaned points. And I did it, one of the steps I did is I did a PCA, so a principal component analysis, and using the first three axes, I created a niche volume for each Cyperaceae species that I had data for. So now I'm able, based on those points, to give you an area, like a calculated area, overall area associated with each species, but I'm able to sort of give you a niche volume for each species also. Like I said before, we have two different ways of looking at plant distribution that I calculated. You have something called the area of occupancy. So that's looking across a, a grid and you know which area of the grid, how many areas of the grid is that are points for that species, is how that's more or less calculated. And then you have an extent of occurrence, which is based on a hull where they just you draw a big line around the entire distribution of a species. So I have those geographical or area variables that I calculated. And then I looked at all my variables and I did some, looked for collinearity, so correlations amongst them. And I found, in this case, I'm just taking a subset and I'm showing here that potential evapotranspiration and latitude are positively correlated and they have a very high correlation values. so I choose only one. I choose in this case, I think I kept latitude. And all of this Cyperaceae work is looking, working with genome size, not polyploidy. Like I mentioned before, it's difficult in the Cyperaceae as a response. So the way I looked, modeled this, is I did a series of phylogenetic generalized least squares of analysis, so PGLS. And I looked at their Akaike 
information, so IKEK weights, so it's AIC weights, and I compared them. So the most supported model will have, I think for AK, AIC weighted, it's the highest that value you're looking for. So when I looked at all my variables after the analysis, elevation and genome size was the model that had the most support. But it was not a significant relationship. But it does look like there is something there. The second most supported map model, according to the AIC weights, were, was the nitrogen. So nitrogen and genome size, we're seeing a positive correlation, like you'd expect. And it's a, I'm using here a corrected p-value because I'm correcting for multiple tests using the same data set. Here is the third most supported model is the one with an interaction term between nitrogen and phosphorus, but it's not a significant relationship for either. But the p, the p was. And then the final model that I'm going to mention today that I did find some support for was between genome size and precipitation in the dry season. So to summarize, there was a weak relationship between genome size again and nitrogen, but this was looking at a larger data set, and also genome size and precipitation. Uh, there's the effective structure in my data. We have to think when you're looking at the CIPRI, these world data sets, that there's some major undersampling in some areas of the world. Uh, Africa, Central Asia, hmm. South America, I think Central America is also really other undersampled. So you have these underlying biases in the data. And there's going to be a large portion of the Cyperaceae or the Cyperids is based on Carex data because Carex are where Western Europeans and North Americans live who collect these. So ways forward, you know, look at other covariates and refine the models and you know, potentially investigate this in different ways looking at larger taxonomic scales. So to finish, I have a lot of people to thank for over the years because this has been this project's been going ongoing for a number of years now. Uh, Peter, my current working group, um, several co-authors, former labs, Metacentrum that I use all the time, uh, field help, iNaturalist contributors, herbarium creators from many herbaria, and several field botanists in Southern Africa who I was in constant. Um, talk collaboration and some funding sources. So at the end, I'd like to ask, is there any questions? Thank you, Tommy, for such a great presentation. It is impressive how the size, the amount of your work and uh, the breadth of your interest, from the taxonomy to the phylogeny to the ecology, it's really highly impressive. So now we have time for the question and comments. Um, <laughs> anyway, Don't ask I, me. I have two related questions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you have some idea why this science is so successful or so abundant in South Africa? Because I remember that every group which, which, which is successful here must, must somehow go with, with a very low nutrients. Yeah. So this is, a, this, is, uh, this is the second question. How Schenus is dealing with low nutrient contents? You know, uh, is, it, is it some special, something like Restion AC, Protein AC, or Earth AC, some mycorrhizis, or some... I, I'm not sure about mycorrhizal relationships. Um, one thing, there's a few things about the genus that we, we notice when we're study from them, with them. So it's, they do really well in the Finbus and the Kwanga in Western Australia. So the Kwanga is sort of a similar ecosystem to the Finbus, but in Australia, low nutrients, especially phosphorus. Some strategies that might be at play, rooting, you know, rooting strategies. The sheenas really produce a lot of rooting matter. So not like a one tap root, but a lot of small roots, which I think have a lot of surface area to get at the, to get 
at the nutrients that are there, the little few nutrients that are there. But, but, but this will go in, in, in different, it will go opposite to, to, to a result with genome size, because if you have a genome size, you should have perhaps large cells in the roots, and they will be not so good, capable to, because they have very large, very small surfaces. Yeah, it's going to be small, I would think, because the roots, the roots themselves are very small. They're very fine rooted. Yeah, but also the size of the, of the cells in the roots must follow the same rules. They cannot be uh, so small. Yeah, the because you'd expect the genome. Size, so I see what you're saying. So yeah, you'd have to look at the. You're right. You'd have to look at the cell size to see, because you'd expect the larger genomes on the, on the upper material will have larger cells. <laughs> And the lower, we'd also have lower cells. But you do have, I, do, I did notice, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think apart from genome size, one of the strategies might be the rooting. But also, they do form pseudo-dousiform roots in cases. Um, so dousiform-like roots, which can help. And um, somebody by, who worked with Michael Kramer by the name of Shane studied that, and he had documented the different types of dousiform. That will help with phosphorus. They are not good competitors. You can't, they're not like the grasses. So the grasses, which are known as, if you just say, better competitors, don't do well as well in the finless, except for maybe something like the Erharta, Tony Verburn looks at. Um, they do well, but generally the finless is low nutrients, and species like, or groups like the Cyperaceae, who have developed strategies, but they're not good competitors, and they don't tolerate disturbance. I think it's just like they've just developed their, they, they can tolerate, they've developed one coping mechanism that's been successful for that low nutrient. If it's in the roots, I would think it's in the roots. And I don't, like I say, my hypothesis is more fine root. I'm not sure. Yes, thank you for, for the presentation, I really liked it. Uh, I uh, have a question regarding these uh, relationships of genome size to nitrogen. So in the, in the last study, on the last uh, large scale, you used uh, the data from soil grids. Yes. Uh, but uh, I think uh, they contain, or, or the, these data measure the total uh, nitrogen. But total nitrogen in the soil uh, is uh, like 99% uh, of total nitrogen it's not, it's is uh, bound in organic uh, matter. Yes. So it's not available to plants. So uh, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't think uh, that uh, this variable really describes the availability of nitrogen to, to plants. It more describes whether like the soil is moist and that's why there is uh, slower decomposition. So, so there is accumulation of peat or, or raw humus. And that's but why there's a positive correlation with latitude and, yeah. and that's the total end off of soil grid. Mm -hmm. I, I think it, it must be some, uh, some other factor that, that's not uh, like direct relationship to, uh, to nitrogen. Yeah, that's what, okay, when I did that measured data set on the Sheenus and I I used, well, I guess that was actually also, I'm actually, I forget which total. I am aware that it's total N and not ammonium and nitrate, because that's what's more important is the available nitrogen in the form of something like ammonium or nitrate. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's a broad scale analysis. I guess it's, that's. No, I would be yeah. like very careful about any the interpretation, interpretation okay. with, with, with nitrogen. Like, I, I will definitely mention that total nitrogen is not the same thing as plant available nitrogen. It's not nearly the same, and, but that's where, what I had to work with at this time. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the previous uh, uh, analysis with uh, nitrogen, uh, so what, what was the source of the data on nitrogen? Was it nitrogen in soil or was it uh, measured in plant tissue? Which one are you talking about? Which uh, the, well, be, before this global study, you, you, okay. you, you, you showed uh, that you found... Uh, so that one, so there's two different data sets. There's the extracted data set, which is using not the soil grid, but one that Michael Kramer and 
this. A few students developed just for South Africa. But again, it's total N percent. In soil. In soil. It is not available. Um, I tried to get at the available lab by actually doing my own measurements, but in the end I had a very small data set because of how to cleaning it up and everything, just how things worked. So there was not a lot that could be said there. But I, I think a good way could be, could be measuring uh, nitrogen directly in plant tissue. Because that's, uh, that's really the nitrogen that, that uh, yeah, no, the plant no, no. is taking. Yeah, yeah, no. I, but there is, a, the there is an interspecific difference in total nitrogen in the plant too, though, right? Because it's species specific. Some grasses, for instance, are just high in nitrogen. They're more palatable. Yes. Others said just tend to be low in nitrogen. They're higher in carbon compounds. Um, so I like I'm just thinking like if there's, there's a lot of like, the part of the model that would be based on the species would be very important to explaining that because I know there's a lot of interspecies specific variation in nitrogen. Maybe that could it's not a good, good idea to, to measure nitrogen directly in plants. Just because it will lead to some kind of circular reasoning. Because if, if you expect that genome class is more nitrogen demanding, and you will measure nitrogen in directly in, in, in the plants, you, you will get some artificial correlation, or you, it, it is very risky. And because it's it's intercorrelated. So this is this is usually used to, to let's say to, to express if, if the if the plant have, have problems with nutrients or if, if it grows in nutrient limiting sites. So and, and typically the, the nitrogen and phosphorus contents of plants in Cape are very low compared to the, to, the, to the normal plants, which which suggests they are really limited with these nutrients compared to, to the normal normal ecosystems. But I would be very then usually uh, ecologists measure the uh, uh, ratios of uh, yeah. nitrogen and phosphorus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, 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 it could help perhaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, it also, if, if nitrogen and phosphorus both can depend on genome size, it's difficult to, take to, to use such a measure uh, and, and compare it again with the genome size. There, there could be some intraspecific variation now. In, in a genome size on nitrogen phosphorus ratios. In, a, in nitrogen phosphorus. It could be, but I, I, I don't know how, how it could help in the analysis. So, I mean, the, the, the problem in the game is that if, if you have a, a group like Erica and Protea and Protasian, which has very specialized roots, can capture the nutrients from, from fungi or which can ex exclude some some acids to make the exodus uh, acids to, to, to dig the nutrients directly from the from the stones. It's difficult to to to, to measure in, in some way how much limited the nutrients are for the plant. It, but I'm wondering, Peter, because for the phosphorus for my measured data set, I use something called the citric acid test. And so that's a, a available phosphorus, because that is... Okay. Mm -hmm. When we did the research in the case, we, we decided not to measure only available phosphorus. We, we, we directly measured all the phosphorus available even in the stones. Mm -hmm. Because if, if, if you know restios and protease, they, they can dig it. If, if, there is some, if there is some phosphorus in, in some... So, they can so they're never really limited. That's yeah. the thing. Like they okay, they can invest half a photosynthesis product. That they can invest to produce some acids, which yeah. so solute the, the stones, and they take the phosphorus from the from the from the stone. So they very if, it, if the nutrients are limited, plants can find a way how how to get them. So it, it's very difficult to measure how they are really limited with the nutrients in, in, in such a type of ecosystem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So it would be, to step one, it would be, I guess not a lot is known about what's happening with the exudates in the, in the Cape Cyperaceae. We don't know, because they are quite common 
there's this genus and then there's the Tetraria that have done well in the Finmus as, as well as the, um, the Ficinia. Mm -hmm. So what is the adaptation? adaptation? Is, it, what, is it a special set of exudates? Mm -hmm. So maybe we can move to another. Uh, Question. Yeah. Um, thanks for your presentation. In the end, you found that there was uh, there was some relationship between the uh, even if it's not available, but the absolute amount of uh, nitrogen and genome size, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, perhaps uh, you could interpret that because uh, genome size that's DNA, not the whole uh, bunch of uh, nucleic acids in the in the cells. So perhaps that means that mm, it, that genome is really a big part of the picking of the whole nucleic uh, set of nucleic acid. That means that there are no, uh, that there are many genes that are not expressed or that are not transcripted. Uh, I mean that the DNA part is much bigger than the RNA part, or at least considerable. And perhaps that this has implications for Michael Lee's theory or, or the genome size and the the selection and action on, on genome size. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, no, I see what you're saying. So I, mean, I mean that perhaps not, have, not, picking, uh, not having in mind that the whole set of uh, nucleic acids, RNA and all, all the types of RNA, not just DNA, uh, well, at least gives some idea of if just DNA already is related to availability of nitrogen, that means that, that DNA is really a big part of uh, the whole set of nucleic acids. So there's not much transcription. Pardon me? That means that there, there, there's not too much transcription. Yeah, so like uh, how much of that DNA is actually transcribed into working. And then that is also a quantity of, of RNA. I it, it, it's, it's a good, it's a good point. It's, it's a good, good point and, and a good okay. note because, because if, if, if you measure the content of nitrogen and phosphorus in the plants, yeah. it, it, it's it's considerably higher in, in progressively uh, dividing tissues or which, which are growing because there is very much oh. RNA and, and so on. Like the apostema, are they? Yeah, are so in, they in, in, systematically active. Yeah, and so it, it could be if you look to the scan. I would expect that such plants, which, which will have problems with such nutrients, will have only a very small portion of their whole body in some, in some stage, in some growing stage. Mm -hmm. yeah, so mm -hmm. I, I would expect that they do, because they have some, some yeah. limited amount of nitrogen to, which, which can use. So they will, be, they will have only a very small part which, which can really grow, and they will recycle the nutrients. So, it, so you're talking like, a, like some like wood, wood, an arctic strategy? This will this will result thinking that the, the, these plants can be very competitive and can grow very fast because they need to spend so time with this recycling. And this could be also the reason why they have not so much use because it will be excessively. Yeah, they're very efficient because the, the yeah. flowering stems, the cones, are photosynthetically active. Yeah, this this could spend some some, some resources and. So this, this could result in, in, in such a they, they aren't perennially green. So it's not like some of the tundra where you have the perennially green, um, some of the Ericaceae, which are, I don't know, Cassiope or something like that is an example of something that's perennially green. But there, in the spring, there is a flush of growth. And then the, the inflorescences are always formed a year. So there is an input every year. Is it like a perniating bud where it's formed already in the previous season? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. okay. So may I have a very simple question? What is limiting Cyberasa in their distribution? Because they are cosmopolitan, but they are all distributed over the whole world. But you found that there are differences between Western Europe and Eastern Europe, so there is some hotspot of occurrences in Western Europe. 
we found some similar pattern in our data that the grasslands in Europe, in Western Europe, are rich in SGs and minkas, but there are not so many species of those families in the western part of Europe. Why? What is limiting uh, occurrences of such a species? So there, no, I, okay, I'm, I'm not as familiar with that data set, so you're saying that in the western... But you, you also uh, show, uh, show that uh, a lot of uh, species grow in western that, but not so many in the eastern. That but is a, to me, that's a pure sampling data bias. Do you think so? Yeah. I, I honestly, I, I'm not, I have never been to some of the, the different ecosystems that might have same Beresia in Central Europe or Eastern going into Russia, but I'm assuming it would be similar to what you have in you know, Central Canada. And they're still present there in different ecosystems. But that Western Europe being black is GBIF sampling coming from iNaturalist. Yeah, so, yeah that's true. It's GBIF. But we, we have quite different sources of data and also see some. But, some, but some it could that be like a historical just people, mm -hmm. the more hours that people put in looking, mm -hmm. the more chance of an occurrence you have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, I, uh, I was wondering about your previous study uh, that, uh, that from Canada, mm -hmm. uh, where you showed that uh, in one plate uh, the species were occurring more often together. Yes. And mm -hmm. in the other, uh, they were more often like uh, excluding each other from the same site. Do you have some uh, explanation oh for it? Oh my gosh, trying to go back to the memories. <laughs> So, Sorry, so is this, the title of the paper was Contrasting Patterns in Co-Occurrence, I think, that we had linear-specific patterns. And um, I guess we were trying to say that, you know, if you're going with classic community phylogenetic approach, that potentially that the one clade with more chance of a species focal plant co-occurring with a closer related so that clade, a process such as environmental filtering might be more important. And for the other clade, the processes that are more important the more distant, would be competition. So that was going by the classical community file that was put forth by Webb in 2000. Now, how much do we buy into that? Um, you know, that, that paradigm has pretty well been shot down. Um, but, um, you know, it could be that, you know, depending on your membership, there are slightly different community level, at the community level. There's something different in your set of characters if they were you know, conserved phylogenetically that would make one process more important than another, I guess. Yeah, I think it, it's clear that in one one plate, uh, like yeah. uh, environmental filtering is the, is the dominating force on the community assembly, and uh, in the other, it's uh, like the effect of limiting similarity. That's but, uh, if I was to get a paper to review who said that was the only two choices, though, I would really like. That. Yeah, but but, uh, but I, I well, I was wondering whether you also looked at uh, maybe some traits uh, within the plates that can. Mm -hmm contribute to either coexistence in one case or to competition in the other. We actually started the study trying to look at some traits, but it didn't get, it didn't come to fruition because of the logistics mm -hmm. of the site. Mm -hmm. um, trying to do work in the Canadian subarctic um, mm -hmm. traits. The data are not in databases, I guess, for such a I honestly, if that is a good point, like if you were to go to try, I have yeah. looked at. I think another one is Ben from. Um, yeah. Yeah. Why isn't his name coming to my mind right now? But um, when you get to the Cyperaceae for those type databases, some of it is just pure garbage. Yeah. And even the the Poaceae, some of the information that I gathered because I did do a little bit of analysis, mm -hmm. and I'm, it was on Calum Grosses. Mm -hmm. And what they, different people were saying about Calamagrossus is the person who inputted the data out was, obviously didn't know what a Calamagrossus was. Mm -hmm. So you got to take it with a green. Yeah, there is also. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there was a good, good 
one from the last year. I, I have doubt if, if I saw the, the picture with this free box plot, which in some uh, received zero. I usually, if I look to such pattern, I always ask me if, if this is not an artifact of some method. Yes. Yeah, because if you have a free groups, one is zero, one is plus one, there are is minus one. So I always ask if, if this is not an artifact of some zero model, some I think that use of zero model of because if, if, if something in, in some gets, gets me zero again, so it, it could, could it be different that the, the older old you're thing? thinking it was like a methodological or a statistical bias? Some, some bias, yeah. Because it, it's always it's very similar. Because a lot of bias. those community phylogenetic, like that's based on we did an alteration to the classical NRI and. TI, we actually have a focal plant, so it was from focal plant that we did it all. But a lot of those measure, the final metrics that come out are based on the different null models you use, and it would be dependent on what you chose as your null model. And it's so far back. But I do think I looked at a few different null models, and that would have an effect on that. Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. I have a question when you were talking about the machine, I suppose it, that there is um, a lot of difference in genome size and that it is either polyploidy or some like repetitive elements, stuff like that. So you're talking about the when we're looking at the lipronova? Then there is a large scale of genome size yes. compared to other other genomes. Yeah, it, within the trichine. Yeah. And you, you were trying to Well, a lot depends on like future path. Yeah. Like of course. Um, <laughs> that was another question. <laughs> <laughs> so like you know like that would be ideal to bring the uh, Australians in and do a larger study. But I've talked about it with Peter. We'd also have to look at a few other cases within the holocentric Cyperaceae who show a similar type pattern to get power to get power of inference. We just wouldn't do it on the cypher on the shinase. And there are some other cases like the Eliacris that are showing similar type patterns where there's one clay that are right. And you were thinking that maybe this has happened also in the Drosera, where you have one clay that's just like So like it would be a study and you know, looking at has there been some sort of selection mechanism that's been relaxed, for instance, but how do you get at and then that's been a relax that's allowed the repetitive elements to proliferate but not be cleaned out. And it can be quite difficult to, what I understand, get them out of holocentrics because they don't have the same crossing over mechanisms. Um. So, once again, thank you for your nice presentation. <laughs> Next week, we will meet us but we will have a presentation in Czech and it will be about some experiences in nature conservancy in Czech Republic. Yeah?